Hello, and welcome to the N1 Fitness Podcast. I'm your host, as always, Marcus Sadu, and today we've got our third installment of our AMA, aka Ask Me Anything episode. So if you'd like one of your questions answered on the podcast, feel free to drop me a line through the website at n1fitness.com, or you can click the website link in the show notes below and fire off your question, and I'll answer it to the best of my ability. Also, I wanted to mention that I just released a free fat loss fallacies ebook where I myth bust 15 fat loss fallacies that just won't seem to go away. So if you're interested in getting your hands on that, just go to the website, enter your email addy in the pop-up and I'll send that to your inbox. And again, it's totally free. All right, let's get to the questions here. So first one is, what is the best alcohol to drink? So this person didn't specify for what, so in other words, what their goal was. So I'm going to assume that they're asking about what alcohol is best to drink when fat loss is the goal. So the answer is going to depend and here's why. So some folks find that when they drink beer, for example, it fills them up and therefore they don't overconsume food while they drink it. But when that same person drinks wine, their appetite tends to be stimulated and then they, you know, crush an entire charcuterie board that was meant for the table and they, you know, piss off their friends. Different types of alcohol are going to affect people in different ways. And being that fat loss is your goal, it's not simply about how many calories are in the booze itself, but how that alcohol impacts your appetite and food decisions thereafter. So there's also the point of how much, right? So a mentor of mine, Rob Wolf says, drink enough to enhance your sex life, but not enough to hinder performance. I think that's generally a pretty awesome way to go about booze from a social standpoint. And then one more thing to note is how much and what type of that alcohol has you feel hung over the following day. Because like we talked about before, there's an issue of the calories in the alcohol, but there's also an issue of how that specific booze impacts your food decisions while drinking. And then finally, if you find yourself hung over the following day, How that impacts your overall lifestyle plays a big part here. So for example, if you drink too much on Saturday night and then on Sunday you lay on the couch all day, you're crushing Gatorades to quote unquote hydrate, you order in a few times, you're going to be burning very few calories and taking in a lot of calories versus a night where you potentially stayed in, you woke up feeling good the following day, maybe you go for a hike or a walk with a friend, you're making better food decisions. So there's a huge difference here as far as behavior goes and how that alcohol impacts those behaviors and then down the line, sort of the snowball effect comes into play. Also, let's not forget if you're out and about at 1 or 2 a.m., it's not like you're coming home and crushing a really healthy meal, you're going to be reaching towards something like fast food or hitting a local pizza joint for a slice. And then that adds to the calorie total as well. If you're interested in a more in-depth answer to the alcohol and fat loss relationship and how you might want to incorporate it when fat loss is your goal, episode number 46 of the podcast titled alcohol and fat loss, can you still drink and lose weight should be useful for you. Question number two, what should I order when I eat out at restaurants? So when my nutritional coaching clients are eating out, I recommend that they get a meal as close to what they'd have at home as possible. So for example, if someone was going to have some salmon with some rice and veggies cooked in coconut milk with a bunch of spices for dinner, but now that person is heading out. So They might want to grab the tuna poke bowl and then just make some modifications like skipping the funky calorie dense sauce and then asking for the bowl without those crunchy chip things on top. Honestly, I'm not even sure what those are. So basically, you've got a lean protein source in the tuna, a starchy carb in the rice, and then don't even worry about adding a fat because restaurants cook with plenty of oils and butters already, and then they typically add some veggies to the poke bowl as well. Another example might be, hey, someone was going to have a cut of lean steak with some sweet potato fries and some steamed veggies at home. So instead, they might go for a lean cut of steak still 
or some sort of lean protein with a baked potato, hold the sour cream, hold the bacon bits, hold the cheese. Now, normally we don't add any fat with a restaurant meal because of the oils and the butters they already cook with, but in this case, nobody likes a dry potato. So we'll probably throw a small dab of butter on there and then have some steamed veggies on the side as well. I honestly think that most folks overthink eating out big time and instantly feel sort of overwhelmed and then just say, fuck it, I'll go for the burger and fries. If you find yourself getting flustered when the server asks for your order, you can always look up the menu ahead of time and decide what you want. Or like I said, just order something that's as close as possible to what you'd have at home. Also, feel free to order off the menu, meaning ask for exactly what you want. This is likely going to be a more expensive route, but if you don't mind ordering off menu, you can literally get exactly what you want. Now, having said that, if this is a treat meal and it fits within your goals, just ignore everything I just said and go for the pizza or the pasta or something yummy like that. Next question. Are, oh, this is fitting. Are pastas and bread unhealthy? So it's really difficult to answer questions like this because they're quite vague and lack context, but I'm going to do my best here. So first of all, it's going to depend on the person. So you want to be sure that you tolerate pasta and bread. So the fairly common allergen or food intolerance in both foods is gluten. If you don't tolerate gluten, you can go for something like rice pasta or gluten-free bread instead. But We'll assume that this person has no issues with gluten and we'll assume that this individual's goal is fat loss as well. Under the context of fat loss, calorie intake is going to be paramount and all pastas are not created equal. So are we talking about a fettuccine Alfredo here that's probably upwards of like 2,000 calories plus or are we talking about making some whole wheat pasta at home using a homemade sauce that's solely tomatoes and salt and then adding something like prawns and some spices and vegetables. So these are two very different things. Now, typically pasta is very calorie dense, especially when you order it out. So if fat loss is your goal, just be aware that when you add up the caloric load from the pasta itself, the sauce, the oils, butter, potentially whatever else you throw in there, it really adds up to a lot of calories. On the bread front, if we're talking about a bottomless white bread bowl at a restaurant that is just used as a vessel to like get more butter in your belly, probably not the best call. But on the other hand, if it was like a couple of slices of high fiber sprouted grain bread that we're making a turkey and cheese and lettuce and tomato sandwich with, that's a whole different ball game. So context is king. First look at digestion because as you guys know, I really emphasize the importance of digestion and eating foods that you tolerate well. And then factor in whether the pasta or the bread fits within your goals. And also, whenever possible, go for the higher fiber, more quote unquote natural version of the pasta or bread if you can get your hands on it. Next question is... I eat a lot of the same foods day in and day out. Should I be switching it up more? So I personally eat a lot of the same foods day in and day out as well. I find it really simplifies things for me and I typically go for weeks or maybe even a month or more eating the same-ish things day to day and then I switch it up to some other foods for a while. So for example, lately I've been eating a lot of oatmeal with blueberries. I don't know why, but I'm just loving it. I'm having it virtually every day. It's heating up now. Summer is approaching fast. So this may change just because it's a warm meal. And, you know, as the as it tends to heat up, I might not want like a warm, hot meal. But for now, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Now, some folks may think, well, if you're eating the same things every day, you're going to be nutrient deficient. And I'd encourage you to zoom out a little bit and take a look at the big picture. So no one becomes nutrient overloaded or deficient overnight. This stuff takes time. So even switching up your foods every few weeks or months is totally fine in my opinion. Also for some folks, It's really beneficial from a fat loss perspective to eat a bunch of the same foods day in and day out, especially if they're not counting calories. Because if they have three whole eggs and a cup of oatmeal for breakfast every day, 
and then their fat loss plateaus. Their intake is so consistent and easy to track that cutting back to say two thirds of a cup or half a cup could get their fat loss rolling again, as opposed to if they were eating different foods every single day at every single meal. So it's just a lot tougher to account for that much variance. Eating in a similar way day-to-day also reduces decision fatigue to a degree. So some of Brian Wansink's research, who I interviewed on episode number 39 of the podcast, states that we make about 200 food decisions per day. So even if some of the food decisions are automated, it frees up a lot of decision-making bandwidth for other things in our lives, I'd say. A simple example of this is Steve Jobs. So he wore the same thing every single day. So he didn't have to use any unnecessary energy or time or thinking or brooding over what outfit he was going to put on. He just wore that turtleneck and jeans every single day. So essentially it just simplifies things, which I'm all for because simplicity is usually quite sustainable. Now, if you're someone who likes to switch things up meal to meal, day to day, that's that's totally fine too. Everyone's different, so gear your choices towards whatever preferences you have. Next question, is there an optimal time to consume carbs and is there increased carb absorption pre and post workout? This is a good question. In theory, yes, there are more and less advantageous times to consume carbohydrates. And the most advantageous time is when insulin sensitivity is at its highest. So what is insulin sensitivity? It refers to how effectively your body can use glucose or carbohydrates. So being very insulin sensitive means that your body is good at using carbohydrate. And having low insulin sensitivity or being insulin resistant means that your body isn't as effective at using carbs. So we want to be highly insulin sensitive. So essentially what happens when we eat food? Our stomach breaks it down, it goes into our bloodstream as glucose, and then the pancreas releases insulin which clears the glucose from the bloodstream and puts it into various tissues. So in the case of a type 1 diabetic, their bodies don't produce insulin to clear that glucose from the bloodstream, so they need to inject it. In the case of a type 2 diabetic, their bodies have become very insulin resistant as a result of poor diet. So their pancreas releases insulin, but their body has become insensitive to it, or essentially doesn't quote unquote read it or acknowledge it, and so they release too much, and then they get all sorts of blood sugar swings and crashes, and it leads to all sorts of health issues. Now, what does this have to do with the question about timing your carbs? We all have a base level of insulin sensitivity due to our lifestyle. So maintaining a healthy body weight, eating well, exercising, quality sleep, all of these things improve insulin sensitivity. Within that, we all have different times during the day where we're slightly more insulin sensitive. And these times are first thing in the morning, before workouts, and after workouts. So circling back to the question, is there an optimal time to consume carbs? And is there increased absorption pre and post workout? Technically, yes, but in my opinion, This is a classic example of majoring in the minors because what matters most for fat loss or weight maintenance is overall calorie balance. So are you slightly, and I really emphasize the word slightly, more insulin sensitive in the morning, pre and post workout? Yes. But if you favor eating carbohydrates at these times and then violate the principle of overall calorie balance, you're shooting yourself in the foot. I'll give you an example. So someone says to themselves, I need to cram all my carbohydrate into my first meal of the day in the morning, pre and post workout. So they do that. But this person might not be hungry first thing in the morning and pre-workout, personally, I don't know about you, I like to feel light and energetic. So I don't want my body to be digesting a bunch of food. And then post-workout, Honestly, I'm not even all that hungry for at least an hour or so, and this is really, really common among other people as well. So say this person hypothetically crams all their carbs into these windows, but they're actually most hungry at night. But they use the majority of their calories at breakfast and, at, and pre and post workout, so then they eat more at night 
because that's when they're hungry and that violates the calorie balance principle. So it's basically just an order of importance thing here. Is there anything wrong with favoring carbohydrates towards the morning and pre and post workout? Absolutely not. But overall adherence and consistency is king. So I just don't want folks to get their priorities mixed up around the timing of carbs. It's more like an icing on the cake sort of thing as opposed to a principle because your overall diet and body composition is going to determine your insulin sensitivity way more than when you consume specific carbohydrates throughout the day. I know that was a fair bit of detail, so I hope that made sense. If you'd like me to elaborate or explain this concept of insulin sensitivity or type 1 and type 2 diabetes, just let me know and I'd be happy to do that. I'm actually thinking about dedicating an episode to type 2 diabetes specifically because it's actually 100% preventable. No one should be getting type 2 diabetes because it is a lifestyle disease. And again, completely preventable via quality nutrition, movement, sleep, and stress management. Next question, how much protein should I be eating to build muscle and how much protein should I be eating to lose fat? So I like to set protein right around 0.7 to 0.8 grams per pound of body weight for most of my clients, depending on their goals, their preferences, and then also their body composition and overall weight. So where these numbers tend to get skewed some are when people are either very light or very heavy because If someone, say, is 300 pounds with a high body fat percentage, eating 0.8 grams of protein per pound of body weight is almost 250 grams of protein daily, which is a shit ton. So I would likely modify things in that instance unless that person really wanted to eat a really high protein diet. And then on the contrary, if someone is super light, going with 0.7 grams per pound for, say, a 110-pound person is only... 77 grams per day, which may not leave that person feeling all that satiated. So we may bump those digits up because protein is the most filling macronutrient over carbs and fats. So it depends on the person and where they're at, but on average, I like to have folks between 0.7 and 0.8 grams per pound of body weight. And this is because most of my clients are general population folks, not athletes or hardcore bodybuilders with really high training volumes. As far as the numbers potentially differing when your goal is fat loss versus muscle gain, this is sort of counterintuitive, but when your goal is fat loss, protein intake is most likely going to be higher than when your goal is muscle gain because when your goal is muscle gain, your intake can afford to be lower. The reason being is that being in a calorie surplus in itself is muscle sparing. And being in a calorie deficit, you're more likely to experience muscle loss. Now, muscle loss really isn't anything you need to worry about unless you're getting very lean. And I'm talking well into the single digit body fat percentages for men and then low teens for women. It's very, very lean. Now, as a side note, if you stop resistance training, you could eat 500 grams of protein per day and still lose muscle because muscle requires a stimulus to stick around. So protein is just a catalyst to muscle growth, but you can't build or maintain muscle if you don't stimulate it via resistance training. Next question, what are your thoughts on Dr. Stephen Gundry's book, The Plant Paradox? I've read this book. It's an interesting book. I think that Dr. Gundry can be a little bit alarmist in my opinion. However, From my understanding, he works primarily with folks with autoimmune conditions, so nutrition likely has to be a lot different for those folks. Now, autoimmune conditions are essentially when your body can't differentiate between good cells and bad cells. So it's like friendly fire in the army. Your body is killing off both the enemies and the guys on your own side because it's not able to differentiate the differences in in the uniform. Now, there are at least 80 types of different autoimmune conditions as of right now. They're quite common, and a few examples are celiac disease. So these are people that get very sick when they consume gluten. Type 2 diabetes is another one, inflammatory bowel disease, multiple sclerosis, psoriasis, which is a skin condition, rheumatoid arthritis, which attacks the joints in the body, but most commonly it happens in the hands and the wrists, and then lupus, 
thyroid disorders are autoimmune as well. So a lot of conditions fall under the autoimmune umbrella. I'm actually thinking about putting together an episode dedicated to autoimmune conditions as well. So if that's something you're interested in, let me know. I'll make that happen. Now, how does this tie back in with Dr. Gundry and the plant paradox? So every living thing on the planet that can't fight back or run away has a survival mechanism. And in this case, we're talking about plants. So plants can't pick up and move. They are rooted in the ground. So they defend themselves via chemical processes. So let's say a fox comes along and starts eating a whole bunch of spinach. Honestly, I don't, I don't know if foxes eat spinach, but bear, bear with me for the sake of this example. The fox eats up a ridiculous amount of spinach. And again, the spinach can't get up and run away from the fox. So it has chemical properties that actually poison the fox to a degree if it eats too much of a given plant the spinach in this case. So this is how plants survive. They are chemical masters and they've been on the planet longer than all the animals. They have an incredible amount of intelligence. So the same thing that can happen to the fox can happen to us. If we consume too much of a given substance, this is how the plant survives. Otherwise they just get wiped out and go extinct, right? They have to have this mechanism in place. Now, the plant paradox talks about this process of how plants, for lack of a better term, defend themselves in more detail. And certain plants potentially have more detrimental impacts on some folks than others when they're consumed. So some folks are sensitive to things like nightshades, for example, which you may have heard of. Some examples of nightshades are tomatoes and eggplant and white potatoes, bell peppers, etc., We are all different in our tolerance to these plant chemicals, and it seems that folks with autoimmune conditions are especially susceptible to some of these foods, as well as others because their immune systems aren't quite up to snuff compared to folks without an autoimmune condition. So like we said, autoimmunity is essentially when your body can't differentiate between healthy cells and unhealthy cells, so they attack them all. The immune system gets rid of the things that aren't meant to be there and keeps the things that are meant to be there. But in an autoimmune condition, it can't differentiate between those two, so it wipes them all out. So the plant paradox outlines these plant defense mechanisms in more detail and then specifically how they relate to autoimmune disease. For the average person with normal immune function, it just most likely isn't a necessary level of food elimination or detail to implement. So the info just doesn't really apply as much for folks without autoimmune conditions, in my opinion. But if you're just interested, it might be worth a read. Now, I've worked with quite a few folks with autoimmune conditions, and I will say that the gut and digestion is fucking paramount. I can't emphasize this enough. I mean, gut health is extremely important for everyone, but if you've got an autoimmune condition, what you eat is going to make or break your condition. Diet is your number one tool, hands down. As you might be able to tell, I'm super passionate about autoimmune conditions because they run rampant in my family, and so I'm really passionate about the topic and I've learned an absolute ton about it. It's just fascinating stuff. And the common treatment is to use immunosuppressive drugs, which leads to all sorts of other issues when, in my opinion, diet is just by far the most powerful tool with nothing but awesome side effects like improved body composition, energy levels, mental clarity, reduced brain fog, Fuck, the list goes on. So there are no negative side effects essentially to eating better other than it requires more effort, right? I'm not saying that drugs don't have a place in dealing with autoimmune conditions, but I think that the first line of defense should be lifestyle related and then we can use the drugs if need be. But I just think that there are better ways to go about these things for a lot of folks. All right, guys, that is it for AMA number three. If you'd like your questions answered, you can reach me on Instagram at N1 Fitness or through Facebook at Marcus Sadu or the N1 Fitness page or just through the website, which is linked below, n1fitness.com. If you found this episode useful, share it with a friend, family member, or whomever you think might benefit from it. 
And actually, especially for the folks with autoimmune conditions, this is really important stuff because more and more folks are experiencing these conditions. And I think that a lot of people are only aware of the immunosuppressive drug route, whereas they might be able to manage their symptoms via nutrition and gut health and getting their digestion on track and all that good stuff. Also, if you're interested in the free fat loss ebook I mentioned at the beginning of the show, you can go to the website, type in your email into the website pop-up and I'll send that right over to you. Lastly, if you'd like personalized one-on-one nutritional coaching or workout design, check out the website for all that as well, n1fitness.com. And thank you guys so much for listening. I will catch you on the next episode. See ya.